Bruno Castro da Silva. He's a professor from the Inf uh, Institute of Informatics of the Federal University of the Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, and he received his PhD in computer science from the University of Massachusetts and an MS and BS from uh, the Federal University. Uh, without taking more time here, I'll let him go ahead and get started. Uh, learning reusable skills and behavioral hierarchies. All right, thanks. Can you guys hear me? Hello? Okay, good. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about these methods that we are working on for learning what we call reusable skills or parameterized skills. And before I formally define what this means, I'm going to give you first a high-level explanation of what the objective of this work is. So we all have our favorite machine learning algorithms, right, that we use to solve different problems. But the question is, what happens if you have to solve not only a single learning problem, but a bunch of problems that might be related somehow. So you have a family of problems or a distribution of problems. That could be learning problems or optimization problems. What do you do in that case? So one possibility is every new problem that arrives, you just solve it from, from scratch, completely from scratch. But that would be a waste of time. It takes forever. We don't want to do that. So how do we solve that more efficiently? The second question is, I'm talking about skills, right? So why did I, use, did I choose this specific word? Before I talk about what skills mean from a mathematical point of view, as we define it, uh, I'm going to talk about skills in humans a little bit. So one of the main reasons why humans manage to become competent in a wide variety of problems is because we have this capability of learning, refining, and combining skills. So when we're very young, we learn grasping skills, for example, that allow us to manipulate different objects of dif different shapes, different weights, and so on. And later on, when we're a little bit older, we can reuse these skills, combine them with other skills to solve even more complicated problems, for example, um, playing with building blocks. So we can pick up different objects, pile them up, push them, see what happens, and so on. And this is a process that happens continuously throughout our lives. We keep doing this, and essentially we, we build a library of skills. And we get to the point where we can solve really complicated tasks like assembling a watch or uh, playing basketball. Right. So why am I talking about skills? The reason is that the thing that all these examples have in common is that when we talk about a skill for grasping, for example, we're not talking about being able to manipulate any one particular type of object. Instead, we're talking about being able to manipulate different objects with different properties, different shapes and weights. So it's about, in some sense, solving uh, a family of related problems, of, uh, related objectives. Okay? So, um, in this work, we are interested in one particular type of skill that we call a parameterized skill. And this is just a mathematical procedure that is going to allow us to solve uh, distributions of related learning problems or optimization problems. And we say that these problems are parameterized because we assume that it's possible to describe exactly what is your current objective that you're trying to solve via a bunch of uh, parameters, numbers. Okay? So let me give you an example. Let's suppose that we have a soccer playing agent and that this agent wants to learn a skill for kicking a ball, kicking a soccer ball. During a soccer game, uh, you may need to execute lots of different kicks with different properties, uh, with different forces towards different places in the field. And so how do you do that? Right? The, the first thing that we have to note is that learning a single type of kick, not all possible kicks, just one, with one specific force and towards one place on the field, that's already a pretty challenging problem, a pretty difficult learning problem. And we actually see that in practice when we see humans practicing kicks for the first time in their lives. It's a pretty difficult thing to learn. So, but let's assume that we do have access to some learning algorithm that uh, takes that kick, refines it, and eventually gets to something like that. Now, that's a very powerful kick that maybe you're going to use if you're trying to score a goal, for example. But if you want to pass the ball to another player, that's not the right thing to do, right? So um, instead, what you would like to do is something like that. It's a different type of kick. It's a variation where now you're using the side of your foot. So it's not so powerful, but it's way more accurate. And a third possibility would be to combine these two kicks and come up with a third type of kick that you can use in a different context, for example, free kicks. So what's the, the point of all these examples? The point is that when we talk about a skill for kicking, we're talking about the capability of executing not only a single kick with a specific set of properties, but a family of related kicks that can change and vary in different ways. Okay. So intuitively, that's what we mean by a skill. 
All right, so let's suppose we are trying to learn these parameterized kicks, right, where the parameters of the kick describe properties that you want uh, it to have. How are we going to do that? The naive approach would be, let's just, for all possible kicks that exist in the universe, let's learn how to execute one of those from scratch. That's never going to work, takes forever. There's an infinite number of possible kicks. So we need to do something a little bit smarter. Instead of doing this, what we want to do is to uh, learn just a few examples, just a few variations of these kicks with different parameters, with different forces, different target locations. And based on these examples, we want to construct a single general skill for kicking that is going to be parameterized in this case by the desired force and the desired target location. So the skill is just a procedure that is going to take as input the properties of the kick that you want to execute and that is going to produce on demand without requiring any training and a good estimate of how to execute that kick. That's the objective. Okay? So of course, all these examples are about kicks and motor behaviors, but in general, this is applicable to any learning problem or optimization problem where the solutions are given by parameters. All right, so uh, what am I going to talk about today? First, this idea that skills, with, these are mathematical procedures that we can use to rapidly estimate solutions to novel problems that are drawn from distributions of related learning problems and uh, without having to solve them from scratch all the time. And we can do that basically by learning properties about the geometry of the solution space. So each solution is like a point in some high dimensional space. If we can learn properties about that space, it becomes way easier to make good estimates of how to solve new problems without actually having to train to, to solve those problems. There are three main contributions that we are introducing. First one is a method to learn these parameterized skills from limited data. We also show how to create hierarchies of these things, which is nice because then you can have ever more abstract skills or behaviors. And finally, we show how to actively design training regimens to, to train a skill, to acquire a skill. And this is a neat idea, I think, because it's like a, an active learning approach where, for example, if I want to become really good at kicking soccer balls, the question is, which types of kick should I practice now to become not necessarily only good at this particular kick, but to improve my performance over all possible kicks that I may need in the future? Okay. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to discuss points one and three. I don't have time to discuss all of them. So what is the setting that we assume? We assume reinforcement learning problems. I assume most of you know what reinforcement learning is. If you don't, I have a few slides showing a few applications. But reinforcement learning is basically the problem of how to select actions. You, you assume that the agent can select one action out of n at every time in its life. And the, the goal is to select a sequence of actions that maximizes some measure of long-term performance. So let me give you a few examples. There are a few examples uh, like classic applications in robotics. For instance, this one, uh, there's this uh, robotic arm. And the actions that it can choose from are basically the movements that the arm can execute. And the goal is to learn how to flip pancakes. So not very useful, but... Um, so you can choose whatever reinforcement learning method you want, and it's like a trial and error process. It keeps trying things, eventually learns how to flip the pancake. So robotics is one of the classic applications. There are more abstract applications. For example, digital marketing. Now, the actions in this case are not movements of a robot anymore, but the actions are decisions of which ads you're going to show to a user. And the, the goal is to make people click on those, those ads. Okay? Uh, there are some interesting applications of reinforcement learning to clinical treatment of HIV uh, patients. And now the, the actions are decisions of when to cycle patients on and off some drug therapy that uh, doctors designed. Okay? And the goal is to maximize cell count of some type that the doctors know is important in this case. And finally, you, you guys probably heard about this. There's uh, some uh, new result that came out of this startup company called DeepMind recently, where they use reinforcement learning and accommodation with neural nets that allow them to beat one of the best players of Go, which is this ancient Chinese game, really difficult to play. And everybody thought that this was decades ahead of us, but it worked. So this is reinforcement learning, all right? Um, in this work, we make an additional assumption, which is that we are not going to solve necessarily just a single reinforcement learning problem. We actually might be facing a family of, or distribution of lots of reinforcement learning problems that are related in some sense. And they could be actually infin an infinite number of problems. 
And the assumption is that uh, we're not going to solve each one of them from scratch. We're going to practice on a few of them and use those learned solutions to try to estimate the solution to novel problems without having to explicitly solve them. So how do we do that? Let me give you an example. Let's continue with the example of the, the agent trying to kick a ball with different uh, parameters. Usually when you use reinforcement learning, the solution, for example, for kicking, is given by a vector of parameters. For example, 100 numbers that describe how to move the body of the robot to you know, kick the ball. So if we pick one pair of those parameters, force and direction, and use reinforcement learning, it, it's going to give us one solution that implements that particular kick. So it's one point in this 100 dimensional space. Now, if we change the properties of the kick a little bit, the solution is going to change a little bit most of the time. Uh, and why is that? Because if I change the desired location of the kick, probably I have to adapt the movement of my body just a little bit. It's not going to be something completely different. Um, so what that means is that by smoothly changing task parameters, I smoothly move over the surface of solutions. But I'm saying uh, usually that happens because the, the space of solutions might be actually discontinuous. You might have these disjoint surfaces that compose the, the space of solutions. So each one of the surfaces is called a chart. The whole thing is called a manifold. The words don't matter. It's just how people call these things. But the point is that we know that there's lots of really efficient algorithms for doing what is called manifold learning. And manifold learning are basically techniques that you can use to estimate properties of these kinds of spaces. In this case, the space of solutions for different variations of a kick. And why is that useful? Because if we have access to the information of how this solution space looks like, it becomes way easier to make good predictions for novel kicks because basically this uh, these surfaces, these solutions, they tell you where the valid solutions for kicks are. And that helps you narrow down your search. Okay? Uh, if we have access to that kind of information, we can train a parameterized skill. It's going to be a vector function that takes as input task parameters, the kind of kick that you want to execute, and it gives you back the parameters that implement that kick. So that's the idea. Now, there's a bunch of math involved here that I'm, not, I'm just going to ignore this exists. It's not important. Uh, I mean, it is important, but it's not the point of this talk. Uh, and I'm just going to directly show you the results of what happens if we apply this idea of learning about the solution space, properties of that, and use that to construct skills on a humanoid robot. So this was one of the first applications to this technique. We, we use this robot that is called the iCub. It's a humanoid robot that was built to have more or less the same dimensions as a three-year-old kid. And it's a pretty sophisticated robot. It has around 53 uh, degrees of freedom that you can control fingers, eyes, torso, everything. And it's also a pretty fragile robot. Unlike other things that we do in machine learning, you can't just say, OK, run 10,000 epi learning episodes on this thing. It's not going to work. It's going to break. So, but anyway, what we wanted to do was to have this robot learn uh, a skill, uh, a throwing skill, basically. So something like a simplified baseball pitch. Right? Um, how do we do that? Well, first we're going to use reinforcement learning, which is the base kind of method that we assume. What I'm going to show in, in this video is um, what happens if you use reinforcement learning to have the robot practice a throw at one specific target location. So we place plastic bottles in front of it. It's holding a small ball and it has to predict the whole body movement that hits that ball. So this is for hitting a, solving just one task. So as before, it's sort of like a trial and error process, not completely random, but uh, there's some intelligence in what the agent tries. And you can see that it's getting better with time. Eventually, it learns how to hit the bottle. But so far, we only managed to solve one of these problems. Now we are very good at hitting that specific location. What happens if you change the location? Well, one way of addressing that, there are several ways, but one way of addressing that is by learning a skill, which is this procedure that generalizes your knowledge so you can solve not only a single task, but variations of that task. Uh, how do we practice the skill? We first need to train on a few different target locations. And up to this point, we're just going to select them randomly. So we're going to pick not many, maybe five or six random positions, place the bottle at one of those, run RL, and get a solution. Okay, so that's what I show in this video. The robot is learning how to hit on the left, on the right, very far away from it, sort of in the middle of the board, and so on. So it practices a few of those. I think it, it, it had to practice six. 
which is, which is okay. Six in robotics is, is fine. 10,000 is not. So after that, we take all this information and we feed that to our skill learning algorithm. That's all those equations that I just skipped over. And uh, it learns properties of the space of solutions, which are those manifolds. And they look like this. Now, this was a very high dimensional space. I'm showing you just a few slices of the space. And um, it, there's no way anyone can interpret this. I think I can't. It's, it, the point is just that it's, it's a very nonlinear subspace. And it's very crazy looking. But the point is that it's not random. And that's the important thing. There are some structure in the space of solutions. And we, we can exploit that structure to make good predictions. So um, what I'm going to show in this last video of the robot is what happens if you use this learned skill, this procedure that makes predictions for solving new problems, um, and test the robot in targets that it never uh, tried before. So these are targets that you never explicitly practice how to hit them. So these are uh, movements and behaviors that are directly predicted by the skill for something that is completely novel to the robot. And what you see is that these are pretty accurate predictions, considering that no training at all was involved. They are not perfect always. Sometimes the robot misses the target. by but When it does miss, it's by one or two centimeters, which is not a lot. But the point here is that the robot is able to do that after training six times, which is not a lot. And by just training on six target locations, it, it acquires this skill that makes it competent at uh, hitting any possible target locations on the board, on average. Okay? So that's what we gain by using a parameterized skill. We gain the, the capability of solving a distribution of problems by just practicing on a few uh, select ex examples. Now, I'm not going to gonna go over the results in details, but again, the point here is if you ch train six targets on average, you, you, you become competent in this skill. Now, but there's a catch, OK? Um, and the catch is that when we're training this skill, we assume that we were selecting sample tasks to practice at random, which is not the best way of doing that. So in the second part of this talk, I'm going to explain how we can solve this problem, this limitation. What do we have so far? Well, we have this idea that skills are these procedures that allow us to generalize over distributions of problems, that they can make pretty good predictions for solving novel problems without having to solve them from scratch and from very few training examples, which is very useful. All right, so let me talk about how to solve this limitation that I just mentioned, that while the robot it selected random target locations to practice when it was acquiring the skill. This is clearly not the best way of doing this. Why? Because not all tasks that the robot can choose to practice give the same amount of information about how to solve other tasks. Right? They don't necessarily give information about how to generalize well. So what we want to do is to carefully design a training strategy for the agent. And specifically, what we want is for the agent to select tasks that if you just learn how to do that task, to execute that task, you get a lot of information about how to solve lots of other variations of the problem. So you want to become competent in a wide range of problems as fast as possible. That's the goal. Okay? And there's a lot of evidence from psychology that human experts do exactly that. They make deliberate efforts to uh, change particular aspects of their performances. So again, I'm going to skip most of the math. I'm just going to give you some intuitions of what, what, about what we're, we're doing. First thing that we need to do is to define what we call the expected skill performance function. Now, this is a function that, as the name says, it measures how well the skill does when trying to solve different problems. So it's a function that takes as parameters the task that you're trying to solve, and it gives you a number, how well, what is the performance of the skill. We use this non-parametric method called Gaussian processes. You don't need to know what that is. It's basically uh, a way of putting a prior over these functions. But why is that useful? That's useful because based on this, we can define this other quantity that we called the expected improvement in skill performance. And what is that? That's, that equation basically means the following. Imagine you have your skill right here. You can solve a few tasks with it, not all tasks. The question is, if I practice this task, how much does that help to improve the skill as a whole? Maybe if I practice this task, I get a lot of information about how to solve lots of other problems, so the skill as a whole gets super good. But maybe this task is kind of useless. It never happens in real life. So I get super good at it, but it doesn't help me with other related problems. So there is a way of quantifying that. 
And if we do have access to a function of that type, then selecting which tasks to practice becomes trivial, right? We just find the maximum of that function. And by definition, the maximum is going to give us the task that, if practiced, results in the largest uh, expected improvement in the performance of the skill. Good news is that uh, we found closed form solutions both for the expected improvement uh, quantity and its gradient. So why is that useful? Gradients are awesome. Now we can just take these two quantities and just plug them into our favorite gradient ascent method. It's going to do its thing, and it's going to give us back the task that we should practice next. Because that's the task that, if we practice that, um, we get the highest expected improvement in our capability of solving this variety of problems. We evaluated this problem on uh, a problem, this algorithm on a problem that is called the catapult domain that looks easy at first, but it's actually pretty challenging. And the problem is this. You have this catapult, and the catapult needs to learn a skill for hitting enemies anywhere. You can place enemies anywhere on this uh, crazy terrain. But the catch is that the catapult doesn't know the target elevation, doesn't know the, the height of the enemies, and it has no idea about the geometry of the terrain. So it sees it's kind of like a blind catapult. It doesn't know where the hills are. But even then, it wants to become competent at hitting any possible um, enemy. So this is like you have this infinite family of continuous state, continuous action control problems that are partially observable. So we take that. I'm not going to go into the details about the experiments, but basically we sample a few possible uh, tasks from this domain. And we use that uh, to first learn a skill using our method. It learns the shape of the solution space. And then when we're constructing the training set, we use this active learning idea that I just talked about to uh, select tasks that maximize expected improvement. And what happens is that we see that by just carefully selecting training samples like this, we can learn almost an order of magnitude faster than the, the other possible approaches. So of course, comparing with selecting samples at random is kind of unfair because it's a completely uninformed approach. There are other things that we tried that authors proposed. So for example, one idea that happens a lot in this, in this uh, literature is the idea of focusing your time, the time that you have to practice, on the things that you don't know how to do very well yet. So if, you ha if you're having problems with calculus, well, spend more time trying to learn calculus. This works sometimes, but it doesn't work all the time. If you're in, in, in particular, if you're not making a lot of progress, you should really stop and try something else. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time. Um, so there's, there's this um, very specific, narrow region of how difficult tasks can be so that it's still worth trying to practice them. Practice them. If they're too easy, it's boring. If it's too difficult, it's frustrating. And in, in several senses, this idea of trying to maximize improvement, it's like a way of measuring your progress indirectly. So that's why. Um, we get this very uh, well-informed strategy for constructing the training data set. All right, so let me conclude by saying um, first that we believe that this idea of reusable skills or parameterized skills is useful for constructing open-ended agents. What is that? Well, basically any agents that are not confined to a factory floor, for example. Right? So if you have agents that are going to walk around and do things um, and why do we believe that? Well, if the agent is going to see a doorknob that he never saw before, it can't freak out and just say, I don't know what to do. And it can't just stay in front of the doorknob for two hours saying, let me practice how to open this door. Right? It needs to rapidly produce at least a decent estimate of how to, to behave to open the door. And that's what skills do. Um, we, we have evidence that parameterized skills like this, they can produce solutions to novel problems very fast from a few examples. And we show that it's possible to do guided training when acquiring the skill. So if you don't remember anything else about the talk, remember these two points. The first point is that if you ever in your life need to solve distributions of problems, like you have a bunch of learning problems or reinforcement learning problems, and they are related in some sense, you don't need to solve them completely from scratch. You can use something like this. Okay? And the second thing to remember is when you're learning how to solve this family of problems, you can be very smart in how you construct your training set. You can do active learning to acquire skills, and that's going to give you a lot of a very, a very valuable information for becoming competent as fast as possible. 
All right, so that's what I had to say. If you guys have any questions, I would be happy to take them now. Thanks. Can we have some time for questions? Yeah, in the back. Hi, hello, Diego from University of Buenos Aires. Very nice talk. Mm -hmm. You show the beautiful examples about soccer and kicking and whatever. And right. Have you tried these kind of techniques in human skill and learning? This technique in humans? Um, in, in maybe education or maybe training soccer players? Or no, uh, no. I think, there are a few, I think it's an interesting idea, but there are a few problems. The first problem is that we don't know how humans usually what is the way of encoding these behaviors in our brains. Like here we assume that we're using reinforcement learning so we know that we're using like those 100 parameters to specify a kick. We don't know how the brain encodes that. So we can't really do a search on that space because we don't know what the space is. Um, but regarding imitation learning, yes. There is uh, some work that we've been doing that uses one thing that is called a dynamic movement primitive, which is a way of specifying trajectories. And you can learn that from demonstration. And we do have some evidence that if you're learning from demonstration, you can apply the same techniques. Other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, what was the function used for the throwing robot? Uh, what do you mean? Which function? There are several uh, functions. The optimization function for it was the reinforcement learning algorithm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we use pi square. Is it? Uh, it's one specific, so there, there's um, these methods that are based on cross entropy, and pi square is like an improvement over another method that is called CMAES. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, nice talk, Bruno, and good work. Uh, I would like to know if you have thought of working with different uh, agents together. Uh, because they would have different skills. Right. And how can you compound this approach uh, using different agents? If you have thought of that and... So you mean different agents that need to learn different skills? Yes, and together. Right, right. Oh, well, together we haven't thought about that. The multi-agent case, we, that's very far away f uh, for us. But uh, agents that have different skills, yes, that's actually the second point that I didn't talk about today. And one of the ideas of this work is, uh, is that you, you're learning these skills not because the final goal of the agent is to learn how to throw a ball. That never happens. The, but the idea is that if you learn these skills, after you learn them, you can treat them as primitive actions and use and combine them in, in this hierarchy that I mentioned. And then you can get ever more abstract behaviors. And uh, essentially, the learning process becomes way easier if you have access to skills like this. So yes, the combination of skills is a big part of the work. Okay, but if you have combination of skills with different agents, uh -huh. uh, they can learn different hierarchies of skills yes. because of their reasoning process. Uh, have you thought of that? No. Because uh, you can design different hierarchies according to different uh, reasoning skills. Yes. Yeah, that, that's completely right. Um, I have no idea how to solve that problem. It's a really difficult problem. If you have multi-agents, like a population of agents learning at the same time, as you said, they can learn different hierarchies. It's not clear how to transfer information if it's possible. Uh, it's a good question, but we, we don't know how to solve that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in human beings, uh, we have this theory, for example, that from Vygotsky mm -hmm. that says that we have this uh, proximal development zone right. in which things are learnable. Other things are not learnable because you need to acquire prior competences before you can right. learn it. Do you think that you can adapt this idea to this uh, kind of, of uh, uh, reinforcement learning uh, approach? So that's a very good question, actually. Uh, when these experiments the, with the ICUB, they were developed in Italy in a project that was um, a joint project between computer science and neuroscience and psychology also. And I kept hearing what you just said. Like everybody was saying, this is like Piaget or... And, um, and they, they have very modern theories about uh, what they call intrinsic motivations, which is like, how do you become curious about what you're going to practice uh, next? And it's related to what you just said. There's like a, a narrow region where either it's boring or it's impossible and you have to be right in between. 
And in some senses, in some aspects of that uh, optimization criterion that we're using, that optimizes the expe expected improvement, it's related to expected progress. And that's sort of what you're saying. I don't know now if there's a direct way of linking what we did here mathematically with the theories from psychology, but there is a relation, I think. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and move on to the next talk. Uh, thank you very All much. Right. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, uh, Carlos Garcia Juarado uh, Soares. Uh, he's a principal engineering uh, manager at Microsoft Research Redmond. I've known him for many years. Um, and uh, he leads uh, the development team in the machine learning group. Uh, so I'll let him start his talk on platform for interactive concept learning. Thank you, Carlos. Hello. So today we're seeing incredible things being done with machine learning. And yet, this remains the domain of just a few experts like many of you in this room. Now, what if we could take machine learning and increase the number of people that can use it by, let's say, a thousandfold? What sort of amazing things would we see? Let me give you an example of what I mean. Cortana is Microsoft Digital Assistant. It can understand and respond to commands and natural language queries. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of machine learning that goes into this. There's a lot of classifiers. Now, an interesting thing and, and not very well-known fact about Cortana is that some of these classifiers were created by somebody in just a couple of days that didn't know any machine learning. So this talk is about creating more stories like this. Now, at this point, you can ask, OK, but how many people do we need to do machine learning? How many people even want to do machine learning? So I found out that it's actually more than even I expected. I recently found there's now this class at Cornell, which is text mining for history and literature. And I found about this because the the teaching assistant for the class is, turns out to be the intern that is going to come work with us this, this summer. And she was telling us about how she started talking. She's a machine learning PhD student. And she was talking to some of the students in the digital humanities department and realized that they, were, they had this interest. They, they, they were curious about machine learning, what they could do in, in this humanities uh, space by mining large amounts of text. So they put this class together, and they learned the basics of text classification, a little bit of topic modeling, clustering. And now you get these cool applications like sentiment analysis on ancient Hebrew, right? These things that just surprise us. Also at Cornell, they're using uh, machine learning to try to predict where uh, whales are so that the shipping and the, and the fishing vessels don't, don't hit them. And this is the kind of thing that you often see in universities and large research institutes, where people have the opportunity to find these classes, have the time to take them, they can establish collaborations with other departments. So these things kind of come up. But what about kind of out in the world? So I'll give you another example. My wife back in Seattle, she works at a, at a local biotech company. She's a bioengineer. And this company is trying to find novel therapies and design devices to treat cancer. As you can imagine, they produce a lot of data. They produce a lot of images. And every time she tells me about what they're doing, I go like, but you could use some classifiers to do this, and you could use machine learning to do that. And, and they haven't done it. And, and why is that, right? And the reason is, this is a small company. So most of them are pathologists and oncologists. These are scientists. And their, their skill set is not machine learning. And for a small company like that, it's not easy to just go and, and hire a machine learning, a full-time machine learning person to do this, or even a consultant. Because when your neighbor is Amazon and Microsoft and Google and Facebook in Seattle, there's a lot of demand for these machine learning people. So it's not easy to, to just go and hire somebody. I was actually recently talking to one of the recruiting, um, a recruiter from Microsoft who specializes on finding machine learning skills and, and filling machine learning positions. And she was telling me that very often, like 99% of the time, we make an offer to a candidate, and there's two or three companies that are also competing for the same person. And it used to be just kind of these big names that I, that I said, but now it's also you know, some banks, it's FedEx, it's manufacturing companies. Like all sorts of industries are getting into this game and, and facing this huge demand on, on the machine learning skills. She was also telling me that uh, based on some data from LinkedIn, in the US, there's about 40% uh, of the, the number of open positions for machine learning is about 40% of the total workforce. Meaning, if you wanted to fill all of those positions, you would have to increase the number of machine learning people by 40% overnight. And to keep this in perspective, last year the growth was about 5%. 
So we're clearly not going to fix this problem of, of scaling machine learning by just creating more and more PhD. We just can't keep up. But that is just half the problem. So let's say you could find a machine learning uh, person to solve your problem. And I'll give you an example. So let's say I'm a chef. I'm a chef, and I want to mine the web for recipes, for cooking recipes. I don't know machine learning, so I go and find a machine learning consultant. Now I find this person, and the first thing is that these two speak very different languages. You know? My machine learning uh, guy here, he knows you know, parameter sweeps and precision recall curves and F1 scores. And over on the left, you're, he's talking about you know, the acidity level of vinaigrettes and the mother sauces and cooking temperatures. So they need to communicate, and usually this means I, as, as, the, as the person wanting to build a classifier, need to write a spec of everything that I want to, my classifier to do. So I write it all down. I want recipes of this kind, and this is how you define a recipe. I give it to the machine learning person. Then they need some data, so they go to some crowdsourcing platform. They get some labels. They deal with whatever noise and spam that can usually occur on, on something like this. They go back, and now they actually start generating the model. They tweak it. They throw their bag of tricks at this problem. And now, finally, I get back a model. And in all likelihood, the model that I'm going to get back is not going to do exactly what I want. It's going to fail at some things. Perhaps it's not finding any Mexican food. Now, that would be a real shame, right? So I need to fix that problem. But the problem with that is now I need to revise my spec. I need to send it back. I need to repeat this whole cycle. And this is probably going to take in the order of days, weeks, if not months. And it's going to be expensive. So what I'm going to claim is that if we want to fix this problem of making machine learning really accessible, we need to get to this. We need to get to a place where the machine learning, the machine learning system is in a tight loop with the person trying to build the model. And we need to have these cycles, these feedback cycles happen in order of seconds, not days. And to do this, we need to shift our focus a little bit from the typical machine learning uh, standpoint of you know, performance and uh, the better model and the bigger model to something else like productivity of the teacher, productivity of the person creating these models. What are some high-level abstractions that we can present to this person that they can do this task? How do we make these things super simple? Now, in a room full of computer scientists, this should start to sound a little familiar, right? going from performance to productivity. Because right? we've done this before. Think about programming. Programming used to be a lot harder. right? Like Some of you may remember these days. It used to be the domain of just a few experts. You had, there was this very smart set of people that could deal with these things. And it was all about creating the smallest program, the fastest thing that you could do, and dealing at this level. But now, if you fast forward 30, 40 years, now we have something like Python. Python is not a particularly fast language, and yet it's one of the most popular languages in the world. Why? Because it makes me productive. Right? With Python, I have these high-level constructs. I have interactivity, so I very quickly do something and get feedback. I have this very rich ecosystem for almost any problem domain. There's some sort of package or, or, or library that I can use. Take one step further, you have Scratch, where now even little kids can just move these blocks around. And they're doing real programming, but they're doing it at a much higher level of abstraction and in a much more friendly way. So this is what we're trying to do with machine learning. Now, how do we do this? I'm going to wait for the picture. <laughs> and so we're trying to do this by combining a few other disciplines. We're trying to combine machine learning with human computer interaction and software engineering. And why? Because we want to take this machine learning kind of complexity and all the knowledge that we have as, as machine learning people, put it behind the scenes, and then create this translation layer using human computer interaction uh, principles to create you know, the abstractions, the visualizations, the workflows that make sense to somebody in a particular domain. Somebody that doesn't need to know machine learning, somebody that doesn't care to know machine learning. And now, all of this, we want to tie together with solid software engineering principles so that we can have a platform that is flexible, that is composable, that is extensible. Because as, as, as the experience we've had is that for any of these domains, the solution is not the same. So we can't have one solution that fits it all. And we also use this platform for research. So we need a lot of flexibility. So this is what we're calling machine teaching. The machine teaching focus is on how to make the process of teaching a machine easy, fast, and universally accessible. So we create an implementation of this, and we're calling this the Platform for Interactive Concept Learning. We call it Pickle, and we even have a little nice guy to represent it. So zooming in a little bit, what is in these boxes? 
Of course, on the machine learning side, you have your usual suspects, your learning algorithms. We have binary classification, we have entity extraction like CRFs, we throw in some active learning and some other techniques. On the HCI side, now we're, we're using this, this, uh, a lot of these techniques to bring interactivity to the different aspects of machine learning. In particular, supervised machine learning, where you need labels, you need features, you need to explore your model. And then, as I said, all the software engineering principles that need to go into this to make this uh, effective. So now, how do you take this platform and, and really scale out machine learning? So here's kind of our recipe. The idea is you, you, have, you have something like this where your machine learning people, your ACI uh, folks and, and scientists and engineers can put their expertise, can create these, these, these advanced algorithms. And going back to the programming analogy, this is the people that will be writing the compilers or the operating systems. But now, once you have a platform like this, and if it's customizable, now you can have software engineers just to spend a little bit of time to, to customize it to a particular domain. So let's say, for example, you're, you're a publishing company and, and you want to mine uh, tweets. Now you can have a software engineer just write a little parser for tweets, collect maybe a few million tweets to, to have data, to have some unlabeled data to start. And now you can enable a whole set of what we call teachers. These are domain experts. So in the case of some, some publishing company, this could be you know, the, the person that knows fashion. They could do a, a a classifier to classify tweets about fashion, the person that knows the sports. So now all these people, this large number of people that have knowledge in all these domains can bring the knowledge into machine learning models. So this is kind of our structure. I want to show you uh, what Pico actually looks like. I'm not going to do an actual demo because I did two hours of that yesterday. But Pico is, uh, again, a tool that enables this basic machine learning workflow. So you have the things like labeling. And labeling, instead of calling it just labeling, we call this exploration. Because as I said, you start by collecting a large amount of unlabeled data. Now you need to kind of mine this for a particular concept that you're trying to build. In this case, I'm building here a, a cooking classifier. And as you can see, I go back to this cooking uh, scenario a lot. And that's because I love, to, I love to cook. I like food. So it's much easier for me to explain uh, this type of, uh, of case. So if you're exploring a large uh, unlabeled set, you want to be efficient on how how many labels you want the user to give you, and what type of examples you, you present. So you take techniques from active learning and, and some other algorithms to try to be efficient. And, and as you can see, the, the system is showing me these examples that I can label by just clicking on them. And it's showing me the prediction of the, of the current state of the classifier. So not only does this help me with my labeling, because now I just need to correct, but it also helps me see how well my classifier is doing in any of these examples. But of course, give me labels to just kind of have the story. The next thing you want to do is do uh, features. And in Pickle, we want to have features that are very kind of semantically rich. We want featuring to be another mechanism by which I can inject my knowledge into the model. So again, if, if I'm a cook, I know that most recipes are going to have some sort of cooking method. So I'm going to, for example, here, create a, a dictionary of, of cooking methods. And I'm, I can easily come up with things like uh, you can braise, you can fry, you can poach, you can roast, you can grill. And now I'm imparting this knowledge to the classifier. And these are the features that the classifier is going to use. And I'm telling the classifier, you know, all of these words, when you see them, they're kind of interchangeable. They're all just cooking methods. So now the classifier can learn at a slightly higher level of, of abstraction. I require fewer labels, and it becomes a model that is just easier for me to debug and explain. And the last thing is, of course, debugging the model, because as we know, it's not easy to just get them right. So for this, we have, some, again, some visualizations where here I'm, I'm seeing every example that I've labeled is one of these little boxes. And the color is telling me the, the label, the positive or negative. And the vertical positioning of this is the score of the classifier. This is a very neat visualization because rather than giving you a precision recall curve, which to, to the chef is going to mean nothing, now I can tell the chef, you know, this is how your classifier is separating things into cooking and not. And you want green on the top and red on the bottom. So they can understand that. And furthermore, they can interact with it. So if I see, for example, this guy over here, this looks suspicious because it's, it's classified as, as positive because it's very high, but, but it's, it's red, so I label it as negative. So I can click on it, and the system is going to show it to me, and now I can see, did I mislabel it? Maybe I just need to correct the label. Or it could be something in, that is confusing my classifier. Some examples that I was showing in the demo yesterday is diet pages. Pages that are about dieting, they tend to have a lot of words around food, but they're not exactly cooking. But now what I can do is I can go over here and create a, a dictionary of diet-related words. I could put like calorie and fat and you know, uh, uh, nutrition. 
And now my classifier is going to be better able to separate these two classes. And the point is that the features that I'm putting in, they're understandable by me. And by just adding a few features, I can fix a whole range of problems. So this is, this is pickled kind of at a glance. This is one instantiation of the system where we're doing web pages. But as I mentioned, the idea is that you can, should be able to bring any types of, type of data by just doing some simple uh, customizations. So now I want to go back to the example that I started with, which is the, the Cortana example. And this is the quote by the ah, wrong button. This is the quote by the person that built these classifiers. And as you can see, he describes himself as the experience owner. And this is because a program manager at Microsoft, the role is to understand the user, to understand the customer. So this is the person who better understood what people expected of Cortana, what people were going to say to Cortana, how they wanted Cortana to respond. So this is really the right person to build these models and to train these models. Right? And by give, being able to have these tools, they were able to do this without having like, a bunch of layers of engineers and machine learning people in between. Another example of, of, in Microsoft is the Microsoft Band. Some of you may be familiar with this uh, little device. It's a fitness tracker that you can wear on your wrist. And as, in addition to giving you fitness information, it can give you your text messages. So you can read your text messages, uh, which is easy. But if you want to respond to them, it's relatively hard in such a small device. So some of people in the group had this cool idea that you know, a lot of these messages that, where you need to respond quickly, there are kind of multiple choice answers or yes, no, multiple choice questions or yes, no questions. So you, if you can train a classifier that detects those type of questions, and then you can create an entity extractor that can parse out what the options are, now you can just give the user this. So I can type respond, and the user can, the, the system is going to pull out the two choices, and now you can just tap and, and respond to the message. These models, both the classifier and the entity extractors, were built using Pickle. And the interesting thing about this example, in contrast with the previous one, is that this, as you can see, was made by, by, a, by a researcher at Microsoft who's very, very well versed in machine learning. And yet, they were able to draw a lot of value from being able to use this interactive tool and this very friendly environment. So this is kind of how, what we've done inside Microsoft. But last year, we uh, partnered with, um, with a speech group uh, at Microsoft and, and, uh, and an engineering group in Cairo to bring this out for a particular domain. So we took our kind of recipe for scaling machine learning out, and we said, let's target language understanding. So language understanding in this context means if I want to enable some application to understand a particular domain, a simple domain, let's say I want to do um, a fitness tracker that understands you know, start a run or tell me how many steps that I've taken, some simple commands, that I can use a system like this where we took the, the pickle backend and we built a custom front end and a service on Azure and we created this thing called uh, the LUIS, the Language Understanding Intelligence Service. And I guess I'm in Latin America, so I can call it LUIS. I've been wanting to say the right for, for the longest time, so I, and I always have to say LUIS over there. Uh, so LUIS, let me show you what it looks like. It enables application developers to use this interface. And if you see, it looks very similar to Pickle because it was built around some of the same principles and some of the same code. But now what I can do is, this is, this is again going back to the cooking, uh, if I want to build some sort of smart kitchen clock that understands natural language commands, and it can say, you know, start a timer for the chicken for 15 minutes or set an alarm for 20 minutes for my cake. Now, I can define those intents over here and say, these are a couple of the, the intentions, the commands that I want you to understand. And then these are the entities that I want to parse, like the, the time of, of the timer, the, the amount of time, and the name of the timer. And now I can just start giving examples to the system and labeling them in terms of the, the entities and the intents. And the system is going to quickly learn what is, what is it that I, that I wanted to do. And then once I have a model and I can evaluate how well it's doing over here, I can just push a button, deploy it, and now I get a REST API that I can call. And I get back a kind of a JSON of, of the parts of, this, of, of my query. And the other cool thing is that if I deploy this in an application, all the queries that the, that the service is receiving is kind of saving and logging them all as unlabeled data. And now I can do this active learning loop on top of this data so I can keep continuing to evolve my model and just publishing updates and, and have this in a very kind of fast cycle. So um, this is part of the Microsoft Cognitive Services that I have been mentioned here. If you haven't tried it, I would encourage you to do so. It's kind of fun. Uh, it's free. It's running public beta. And it's going to be going into production pretty soon. It doesn't support Portuguese yet, 
but we do have a Spanish and English, uh, Mandarin, French, and Italian. So I hope I've been able to convey the value of making machine learning universally accessible and of the things that we can do by combining these disciplines. And yet, we're really just getting started. We have many open challenges, such as semantic featuring. I showed you, you know, you can create these dictionaries, but th is that the best we can do? What are the better ways in which I, as the human, can give you the features that you, you, you use for, for your model? In terms of debugging, how, what are models that are more understandable by humans, that are more easier to, to explain? Exploration. How can I guarantee that you find all the islands that comprise your concept? Again, you don't want to miss the Mexican food. How do I create evaluation sets? How do I get a good estimate of what my, my uh, performance in the wild is going to be? And there's many more. So these are all very interesting challenges, and the opportunity for impact is huge. My name is Carlos Garcia Jurado Suarez. Thank you for your time. So we have plenty of time for questions. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, I did have uh, one question on uh, the slide with the blocks where you could actually drill down, down on the data. Can you also get stats like, can you get a precision recall curve? Can you actually get F scores? I mean, it yes. seems to me if you, sometimes that information is actually valuable. Drilling down is also valuable, of course. Yes, so um, I think this is where you, you kind of need to figure out what your user is, because we have some users ranging from people that really want to see nothing to the person that actually wants to see the precision recall curve. So um, we have this as little other tabs that you can click and, and see some additional statistics. And actually, yesterday, somebody that came to the booth mentioned that if you had this way of kind of picking under the covers, this could be a way of also teaching machine learning. So if right. you want to teach the discipline of machine learning, you can do it this simple way. And now you can see some of the, the kind of the details behind. Right, right, yeah. exactly. OK, good. Other questions? Um, well, actually, uh, I did have another one. I just lost it. Um, oh, shoot. <laughs> I had another one I was going to ask. Sorry, I think it's the early morning. <laughs> you can always ask me in Redmond, I okay. guess. <laughs> of course. Uh, other questions? Okay. Yeah, back here. Hello. My name is Felipe Ribeiro from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. It's a very simple question is, what about the parameters from these models, like the number of trees in the hand of forest or the number of those the user has some way of leading? Right. So, uh, this goes back to the, who your user is. So we were trying to make it make very customizable so that if you know what you're doing, you can set some of these parameters yourself. You can say, you know, when you're training the model, do these parameter sweeps and try these different types of models. But also, if you know that and you want to enable some users, you can say, you know, these are the types of models that you want to select from. These are the regularization values that you want you to try. And now the system is just going to do this cross-validation in, in the back. And the front-end user, your, your cook, your, your content editor, doesn't need to see that. Okay, so Thank we you. automate some of it. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? Uh, is it expandable for different inputs, or you have to work with text or whatever? So right now we have sort of built-in support for um, web pages and any kind of multi-stream text. So you think tweets, emails, that sort of thing. It's extensible to any type of data that you want to bring. You, you have to bring basically a function that parses your data and a function that visualizes an example of your data. Uh, that said, we've really been focused on text-based uh, things. In particular, because of the featuring side, we haven't really gone into how to use semantically express features for images, for example. Uh, but the rest of the loop does work for, for images. We have a prototype where we do MNIST, the digit recognition task. And we can do the active learning. We can do the, the, that visualization on the right, everything yeah, right now except the features, which is, I think, an interesting space. Question here. Um, have you experimented with different ways of, sh uh, of course, uh, the process relies on, on the user labeling right. uh, first step, right? 
Have you experimented with, the, with different ways of showing, of displaying the information that you gather uh, for the user to label? Yeah, there must be a kind of rank, right? Yes, so, so you mean in terms of the visualization of the item itself? Yes, yeah, well, uh, you, you probably rank the, the, the data that you, you collect. Right. Right, and then how do you show that to the user? Um, have you experimented with different ways of showing that to the user? Yeah, so if you're talking about how do we select which examples to rank, which are the, mo the most valuable, yes. So we've done, you know, from the simple active learning things, so like uncertainty sampling, to uh, we have some other methods that rather than going right at the decision boundary, they try to do some kind of broader exploration so that you can, we found that the uncertainty sampling sometimes gets stuck in these kind of little islands. So, uh, right now, one of the algorithms tries to do this kind of broader exploration of the space with, that is, tries to find examples that are different from everything you've seen. Uh, we've done um, model comparisons, so we train two different models, and we do kind of the model disagreement between this, this kind of a query by committee type of technique. So a lot of the, the active learning tricks we've, we've kind of tried in here. And we found that, you know, sometimes uh, uh, the combination of doing a little bit of kind of the, the uncertainty sampling, and then going back to these kind of broader explorations uh, helps. And uh, the question there becomes, do you automate this for the user when you go to one or the other? Right now, the user has to choose that, so it's one of those things that are kind of exposed to the user. Uh, but again, an open, open area. Thank you. Other questions? OK, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, move on. Thank you very yeah. much, Carlos. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Katja Hoffmann. Uh, she is a researcher at the Microsoft Research Cambridge Lab uh, as part of the Machine Intelligence and Perception Group and is the research uh, lead for Project Malmo, uh, which is her talk, and I don't see the slide yet. That talk, yes. So go ahead, Katja. One, two, three. Okay, this is much better. Thank you so much. Thank you again for the introduction. I am here to present Project Malmo. Project Malmo is a new AI experimentation platform that we have built on top of the popular computer game uh, Minecraft. And this is designed to make artificial intelligence experimentation as easy as possible. We announced this project about two months ago. And within 24 hours, there were 150 articles about this in the media. We gave interviews to BBC, the Canadian Broadcast Corporation, to Wired. There was a huge amount of excitement about this project. And most importantly, we were contacted by many of our academic partners who were asking, when can I get access to this platform? So there's a huge amount of excitement around the platform. And in this talk today, I want to give you an idea of why this is so, such a big deal. Why it is so important to have cheap and easy experimentation to develop new approaches in artificial intelligence. In my talk, I will talk about first the current state of AI and why we need um, more experimentation to push beyond the current state of the art. I will then go into um, the specific platform we have developed and how it can enable us to measure progress towards answering fundamental challenges in AI. And finally, I will go into a little bit more detail on some of the challenges that we are very excited about and that um, we would like to help researchers work on in the future. As you have um, read in the news and as you are um, researchers in artificial intelligence, you know that there has been an enormous amount of progress in artificial intelligence and especially in machine learning over the past few years. We have now tackled problems that people thought were many, many years away. And some of those um, technologies are moving into products. So they are uh, breaking down boundaries, for example, in communication between people, um, as you have seen with Skype Translator. 
there's some great technology in computer vision and object recognition that is starting to help, um, for example, um, make the world more accessible to help people uh, achieve their goals. And very recently, we have also seen great progress in something called deep reinforcement learning, where, for example, people at DeepMind demonstrated that this kind of technique could be used to solve the ancient game of Go. Given all that um, success, all this progress in artificial intelligence, sometimes you feel like, well, haven't we solved it all? Are we, you know, what is there left to do? Aren't we basically there? What is there left to explore? There are a lot of open challenges, and it's particularly exciting to be in artificial intelligence right now because, because of this progress in recent years, there's now an immediate sense of excitement, the, the sense that we are about to make more progress. There are some great breakthroughs that will come about in the next few years. So there's the question of how we can enable those breakthroughs. Some of the um, questions concern the question of how to develop artificial general intelligence. A lot of the technologies today, a lot of the systems that we can build, are very specialized. They are focused on solving one individual, very narrowly defined task. For example, an aspect of object recognition, or speech translation, or speech recognition. And it takes a huge amount of effort and resources to actually solve each individual task. The question is, can we get to the point where we develop agents that can learn to solve several tasks over the course of their lifetime? Kind of moving in the direction of the kind of flexibility and cross-task learning that we see in, biolog in biology, all the way up to humans. If you look at a child and ask, well, is this child more intelligent than um, Skype translator? Then you see that the child cannot speak any language. They're far from capable in Portuguese to English translation. Yet at the same time, everyone in this room would probably agree that this child is much more intelligent than the Skype translator, because over the course of their lifetime, they'll be able to acquire any number of skills, speak um, the language of their parents, speak different languages, learn to play any number of games, and acquire all the, t all the skills that are necessary for making them a productive part of society to help them achieve their goals. They will adapt to whatever their environment needs them to do. So how can we move, start to move in this direction? And one big gap that we saw um, as we started this project was that we need the right tools to make rapid progress in this research area. And specifically, we saw a need for uh, experimentation platforms that would make it very cheap and very fast to um, try new approaches, to experiment with different approaches, and to make rapid progress. Exactly this need is addressed by the MAMO platform, and I want to spend a little bit more time um, explaining what this platform is all about. As I mentioned, MAMO is based on top of the po uh, popular computer game Minecraft. Just to give me an idea of um, how familiar you are with this, who has heard about Minecraft before? Can you give me? Okay, that's almost everyone in this room. Who has actually played Minecraft? Let's say 20%. Thank you very much. So I will spend a little bit of time of giving, to give you an intuition of why this game is so interesting for AI research. So Minecraft is a very open-ended game where people can do any number of things. There's no clear goal or one specific task that you have to solve to be successful in the game. Instead, people go and explore. There's a big social component. People go on adventures with their friends. People build crazy structures. There's a concept of redstone, which is like electricity, and that allows you to build very, very complex machines. So within that world, this allows us to define many, many different tasks. And now you can see that that allows us to test AI approaches across those different tasks to ensure that we can build systems that aren't just good at one very specialized kind of thing, but then learn, that can learn to acquire very generic um, capabilities or abilities to solve a wide variety of tasks. So this really allows us to push towards this more general kind of learning that we're interested in. It also allows us to look at more collaborative um, aspects of uh, solving tasks. For example, you can go in there with several um, agents, you can have several AI agents in there, and you can start to explore um, how you can learn to solve tasks together, how to communicate about a task. 
Um, finally, there are many um, enthusiastic users, and with uh, Minecraft, we think that we can tap somehow in that community. We can get people excited about working with the platform, for example, to start to learn about AI and the underlying technologies. And Project Malmo now provides an intuitive API on top of the game Minecraft. So this is designed to make it as easy as possible to uh, run artificial intelligence experiments. What this pl platform provides is, for example, embodiment. You develop an agent that is directly exposed, uh, uh, that is directly um, integrated in this 3D world. They um, learn about the environment through their senses. They make decisions, and their actions have consequences in the real world or in the world that they're a part of. Um, at the same time, you have full experimental control and cheap access to data. Um, if we compare this to, for example, experiments in robotics, um, setting up a robot, running an experiment there is extremely costly and time-consuming. So we see um, the Malmo platform as a very important step between um, kind of simplistic experimental setups and the full complexity of the real world. And we think that with this platform, we can provide an important step of having a the, the platform that is complex enough and open-ended enough, but also that allows us this full experimental control and that makes experimentation very easy and cheap. Um, as I already mentioned, tasks are completely open-ended, so you can uh, think about designing tasks that are just about challenging enough to push the current AI technology um, to their limits, and we can build up and make those tasks more and more challenging as we go along, all the way up to something that requires the complexity of interacting with human players. On a little bit more technical note, this is what the platform actually does. So we have um, Minecraft as the environment in which the whole um, experimentation takes place. Um, in this, we have um, written a mod that um, has access to the full game state and kind of um, provides information about what's going on in the environment. And then we have a plug and play kind of interface, an API through which the uh, user, the AI researcher can request the right um, observations at the right level of abstraction. For example, if they want to develop agents that work off of just pixel images to understand perception, then they can provide those observations. Or if they want to provide a more symbolic representation, that would be possible as well. So we can um, kind of have a menu of the different choices of the different capabilities and the different types of observations that you want to expose the agent to. You can develop different reward structures. Um, all that is sent to the Malmo platform itself, through, through which it is exposed to the agent. And all the experimenter has to do is plug into this platform and write the code for what the agent actually does. So process the observations, generating commands, and sending those commands back to the Minecraft uh, mod and the Minecraft environment. Now, this makes it very easy to experiment with diverse AI approaches. You can plug and play, choose the right level of observation that's right for your technique, and this is independent of the task that you pose to the agent. So this now makes it possible to start comparing different types of approaches that might not be easily comparable using previous platforms. And here I'm just giving an example of how this can be configured in a very simple and intuitive kind of format. And all this is also exposed through the programmatic API to give full control to the experimenter. One capability that we have recently added and that we're very excited about is to have several agents exposed to the same environment. So here we see a simple example of how um, an AI agent here on the left is getting stuck in running this maze, and we can have a human player come in and kind of help the AI agent solve the task. So this capability allows us now to understand how we can train AI agents to collaborate with each other to solve tasks in a collaborative environment. So I mentioned some of the capabilities of uh, Malmo. Now, in the final part of my talk, I want to talk a little bit more about what exciting challenges there are currently in artificial intelligence research and how the Malmo platform can help to start um, researchers address those particular challenges. First of all, there are many different um, research areas that we think can benefit from the MIMO platform. 
For example, as I have already mentioned, there is some space for doing reinforcement learning work. For example, deep reinforcement learning is a very interesting area that um, can be pushed beyond its current boundaries, understanding how we can develop um, agents that learn directly from interacting with a complex 3D environment and to make sense of that environment and act in a goal-directed manner. Um, there are very interesting applications to planning. For example, Minecraft has a complex system of crafting different resources or building structures, and that lends itself to research in, for example, um, uh, planning. Um, it can help, we think, um, in research with robotics. So as you already know, research in, robo in robotics can be very expensive, and while at the end of the day, once a technique is fully developed, we need to test it in a more real-world environment. We need to push it to an actual um, robotic platform. We think that Malmo can provide some space of exploring more broadly the different challenges that there are to find, for example, the learning technologies and approaches that are effective in general. And then once that is reasonably well understood, we can push those new technologies to real-world applications. So Malmo is really providing the stepping stone um, towards real-world application there. Um, finally, computer vision is a fourth example where we can do very interesting research. Um, for example, we are providing just the pixel images as a type of observation, but you can also mat match that with more semantic or higher level information. So for example, you can provide the depth map or where various objects are located, and that provides cheap, um, um, a, a source of cheap labeled data that allows you to very quickly test various computer vision approaches. Internally, within our research group, we are already using the MIMO platform for some interesting research. Um, here's an example of how we can use imitation from experts uh, to very quickly develop agents that can walk around in the 3D environment. Here on the left, you see an example of what happens when we use um, deep reinforcement learning in a, from a naive starting point, so with random initialization. At the beginning, the agent just walks around in this large space. Um, it's a quite complex space for an agent trying to um, start to make sense of its environment. And we work with a very sparse reward structure. So the task of the agent here is to get to a goal, and it would only get um, positive reward once it gets all the way to the end. So we can see that approaches like, for example, um, DQN take a very large amount of data to explore this whole space and learn about this space. It takes a very, very long time to actually learn effective solutions in this space. In comparison, if we start from expert demonstrations, so just giving a few examples of, hey, this is how you solve the task, then we can bootstrap from that knowledge, and this allows us to solve the task within just a few iterations and very short amount of time in, in learning how to deal with this data, and also very few um, sample points uh, that, that we have collected in here. So this is just one example of how the platform can be used for interesting research. Um, there are many other tasks that we're very excited about and that we hope to um, help bootstrap in the research community and help to um, facilitate interesting research uh, in this area in the future. One example that I already mentioned is cross-task learning. So the goal is to move towards lifelong learning scenarios where an agent can get um, you know, be put in a 3D complex environment, start to make sense of, its, of the world, start to um, learn how to act in a goal-directed manner, and keep improving its uh, performance and change to um, or adapt to changing environments as the world evolves around it. In MIMO, we can facilitate this kind of research because we can provide access to a wide variety of tasks. For example, we could um, impose a task where an agent has to build complex underground um, public transport systems, for example, here using redstone and minecarts. Or we can have tasks where they build complex structures, like vacation islands over here. And we can pose all those tasks in that single uniform environment with coherent physics, with a coherent type of 
how the world works. And this allows agents to acquire something called common sense knowledge, which we use all the time to address new tasks. But now we can actually simulate this kind of um, environment with coherent physics, with common sense knowledge, common sense knowledge that is transferable uh, over tasks. And this is really important, and this is a gap that existed in previous work where it was not clear how you could easily experiment on those kind of tasks without having to expose an agent to the real world. We can also create this kind of gradient of complexity where we start with simple tasks that the agent can address today, um, but kind of create this ladder where we expose agents to more and more complex tasks and we see uh, and understand how we can teach them to acquire more and more knowledge over time as the tasks become more complex. Finally, we are very excited about um, research in how to collaborate and how to learn to collaborate between agents. Um, here you can see an example of two agents solving a task together. They're communicating, giving some feedback. You are cool. So how do we get to the point where an agent can learn from, for example, a human user that is in the same environment to achieve whatever task the uh, human wants to teach them? In MAMO, we can do this kind of experimentation. We can integrate several agents into the same environment that can be a combination of human and, a and AI users. They share the same world, they can see each other, and they communicate with each other through either gestures or language as uh, we support through the uh, chat feature. So in summary, in this talk, I have given you a brief sense of where the current excitement in AI research is, and one particular area that we are very excited about is understanding how we can go beyond um, narrow AI towards artificial general um, intelligence. We think that a key to enabling this research is to have access to the right tools that make experimentation in this area cheap and very accessible. Um, and we think by providing the uh, MIMO platform, we, really we can really lower the barrier of entry in this space and we can facilitate a lot more research in this area. So Project MIMO, as I introduced, provides this experimentation platform on top of the game Minecraft and enables new research towards general AI. Just to conclude, I wanted to mention that Project Malmo is currently in private beta. We're getting some very good feedback from our academic partners, and we're very excited about learning from this. Um, we plan to completely um, open source this platform by the end of July in the coming summer. So we are very much looking forward to you all um, going to our website, learning more about the project, and once we release it, to try it out um, and see how you can use it for your research. Thank you so much for your attention. We have uh, plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Uh, if I want to use Project Malmo, how I am supposed to communicate to it? It is going to be a, a software toolkit, a library, or a, a web service. Uh, what is the modus operandi for, for, for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, we are considering a couple of different models, but in the first version, the one that we are releasing in summer, um, you will get access to the code. You will download the code to your machine, and you can run experiments completely locally. Um, we are shipping this with a bunch of sample code, so you can install it um, and run a first sample, ex uh, sample agent within a couple of minutes. So, so it's, this it's, is it's going to be a library in, in this first version? Yeah, it's an API that we, that okay. we provide. Okay. Um, we are also considering other models where you could talk through an API. And, and um, what kind of languages I will be uh, able to use? Mm -hmm. That's a great question because we have uh, made a lot of effort in making the barrier of entry as low as possible. And that meant to us that we wanted to make the, the platform completely cross-platform and cross-language. So this um, compiles and runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. And um, the agent languages uh, that we currently support are C, C++, C Sharp, Java, um, Lua, and Torch, and Python. So we think we've covered the major um, languages that our um, uh, academic partners are interested in. But if there are other languages, um, we could add support for those as well, if, if there's interest do, for that. Do you plan something like a socket interface that I can send? Okay. 
Mm -hmm. okay. So the communication that you're seeing here is already happening over TCP IP. So you can run any of the components on a separate machine. Uh, for example, you could think of having uh, the kind of environment server um, somewhere in your lab and then having um, students connect from their own machines where the agents are actually running. So all that is already configured and part of the system. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. More questions? I did have one. Uh, going back to uh, the first talk of the session, one of the problems with uh, real-world implementations, uh, like with a robot, is that you can't train too many times because the robot will break. So if you're able to simulate it uh, in, in something like a universe, like in, in the block world, if it's, if it's a good simulation, it seems you could run the 10,000 training epics that you can't run in the real world. Is that, does that seem like a reasonable application? I'm just, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this is exactly the, the, the kind of scenario um, that, that we support here. Okay. Um, some, some research has to run on the actual robotic platform, of but course. there is a lot of space where we're still not certain about what learning technologies, for example, are going to work best. And exactly for that space where there's still a high level of uncertainty about what technology we need, it's very important to make this um, innovation cycle, a cycle faster, because otherwise it will take years and years to just explore that, that space. And we think that by, by putting this middle ground, we can ex uh, explore that space much faster and finally have more rapid progress towards actual real life applications. Right, mm -hmm. right. Exactly, yeah, that was the goal. Yeah. <laughs> Bruno. So I have a question about the action space. What mm -hmm. is the action space in this case? Is it discrete, continuous? Uh, that's a great question that I uh, didn't mention. So like we have for the observation handlers, it's again a kind of plug and play system where you can choose the action space that you want your agent to deal with. So in the simplest possible case, you may want to focus on a discrete action space that just has um, uh, the major directions of movement. But as you move towards more uh, complex scenarios, you might want to work with a, with a continuous space, maybe add additional types of actions, maybe move head movement, um, something that can model attention, for example, and all of that is supported within the platform and you can just plug and play and pick what um, level of abstraction is appropriate for, for your scenario. Right, so besides the, the actions to move around, what other actions are available? Um, so there's jumping and crouching, there's um, a lot of actions to do with the inventory and crafting, there are actions for using certain items, um, I think there's some for combat as well, so there's that's not a complete list, but there's uh, a whole bunch of actions. Okay, cool. The reason why I'm asking is it seems like uh, you, you've been focusing on maybe using deep learning to deal with these really large input spaces, like the state space is really large. But another application that might be interesting is to explore hierarchical reinforcement learning in this case. Because mm -hmm. most of the things that you have to solve in a game like this, where the environment is so large and there's not a lot of structure, you really need, I think, to build like ever more complicated actions, right? Mm -hmm. Based on primitive actions. Yeah, yeah, I think that is exactly right. Um, I think the kind of action primitives that are already there are, if if you wanted to learn within that space, it would take you, it would be very complex in how you build up a, a skill, like like you said, for example, how do you make that parameterizable? How do you recognize kind of larger granularity actions um, that you can use to solve certain 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 tasks? And th this is a really interesting research area. I think there's a lot to to be explored there. Um, I think the the notion of hierarchy comes up very quickly as you try to address more complex tasks within the platform. Thanks. Mm -hmm. More questions? Oh, couple in the back. Hi, uh, I don't understand the, the idea is to make us teach the machine, right? Say again, sorry? Uh, the idea is to make uh, the person to teach the machine how to solve the, the, the problem. That is one possible scenario that you could envision for, you know. Because uh, I, mean, I could easily think about how about the machine teach us how to solve the problem. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, as, as, uh, as long as you build, learn, how mm -hmm. to, I mean, you can, instead of me teaching my nephew how to play, I mean, you can use the, the example of that you learned it with other person to teach mm -hmm. a person how to learn. 
Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I think that is another um, area of research that is absolutely supported by the platform. Um, that's why we're so excited about putting the platform out there and seeing what interesting um, research questions people pose, what they address on top of the platform, and what exciting research they come up with it. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you are using some kind of uh, uh, symbolic AI techniques within the platform. So are those for planning uh, the ones that uh, you know, are being used? Or is there something else? Or what would uh, those be? And the second, the second question would be, at some point, the frame problem, as stated by Joe McCarthy, you know, Mm -hmm. models of the world and what change, what changes, what doesn't change, has been addressed uh, within this, uh, this project. Mm -hmm. um, both of the questions you asked are, are very interesting and they're really fundamental research questions. Um, within our research, we haven't even started addressing either one of them. Um, what we try to do with this platform is put out the experimentation platform that is needed for addressing questions exactly like the ones you are mentioning. Um, we hope that people will pick this up and do their exciting research on this, start to understand, for example, the framing problem, um, start to understand how you can do planning in a complex space like this, uh, but we're just starting to scratch the surface in terms of research in, in this area and, and addressing those problems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Last question. Okay. One, one more. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation, Kat. It's very interesting. One aspect that's very important for agents as the simulation environment that you provide is the communication aspect. Do you have an idea or preview when it's going to come, the communication language in this platform, or how do we expect to, to achieve what kind of language among agents, for example? That's, a, that's an excellent question. At the moment, the platform we have is already supporting communication through the chat feature. So agents can talk, talk to each other um, by typing words in, in, in the chat window, and they can observe what the other agents say. So this is already allowing research and, for example, understanding what languages agents or artificial agents may develop when they try to solve a task cooperatively. Or it allows research in understanding how artificial agents should be communicating with humans in order to solve a task. Um, we have not yet implemented a feature for spoken communication. So spoken language is an interesting um, aspect that could be supported if there is need for that in the research community. So if you have other suggestions on what kind of things would make your research easier uh, or would help support the particular research on communication that you have in mind, please come talk to me because I'm very interested to hear about um, that feedback. Thank you. Okay. Th um, I think that's it. Uh, th thank you very much. Thank you. And I. Uh,